exponentiation, or we're going to be some, have something that's hopelessly inefficient or even impossible to do. Okay, so let's look at just a, a simple example of modular exponentiation. Uh, suppose we want to take 5 to the 20th power mod 35. How would you do that? Well, I know what I would do. I'd get up my calculator, I'd punch in 5 to the 20th power, and then I would divide by 35, and I'd see what's the remainder. Okay? That'll do it for you. Or maybe you got a button on your calculator that says mod, and you'd use that button, right? Okay, so the point is you could just expand this out, right? You could take 5 to the 20th power and then, you know, divide by uh, 35 and see what the remainder is. However, you have a number sitting here that's like 1,000 bits. You have a number here that's hundreds of bits. You try this, what's going to happen? <laughs> overflow. I don't care how, big, how much memory, how much RAM you have in your computer, you're going to get overflow. You're going to have more bits, it's going to take more bits to store that number than there are atoms in the universe, okay? You just can't <laughs> store that number, okay? It's too large. So we've got to have a better strategy for computing modular exponentiation, okay? Just you need something practical. And there's a nice algorithm. It's called repeated squaring, or sometimes they call it square and multiply, okay? You can see it both ways. Okay, repeated squaring. So how does this go? Okay, the trick here is to look at the exponent. So we're going to take the exponent, we're going to write it out in binary, and we're going to think about building up the exponent one bit at a time. Okay? One bit at a time, starting from the high end. Okay? So we start with a 1, then we want to get 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, okay? and so on. OK, so that's the idea. Build up the exponent one bit at a time, starting from the high order bit. Now, if you think of these as uh, decimal numbers, we're going uh, 1, 2, 5, 10, 20 in this particular case. All right? Now, what's going on here, if you think about it, when you uh, add another bit, you're generally you're doubling this number, right? Okay, 1 to 2, 2 to 5, well, that's double plus one more, 5 to 10, 10 to 20. So we're doubling the exponent unless the new bit that's coming in is a 1, then we have to add an extra 1. So we always double the exponent, and sometimes if the new bit's a 1, we add an extra 1. Okay, so how do you double the exponent? And with all this is happening in the exponent. How do you double an exponent? Hint, hint. Square. Okay, if you square a number, you double the exponent. How do you add 1 to the exponent? Another factor, okay, another factor of the base, okay? One more of those guys gives you an extra one in the uh, exponent. So that's the multiply. Square every time. If uh, there's a one coming in, we need to multiply. Uh, okay, so how's this go? So we start off with the base. The base is five. Five to the first power is five mod 35. Well, that's easy, okay? So that's the first step. Any, anyone can do, can do that part. Uh, next, we want to get two in the exponent. So to get a two, we have to square what we had on the previous step, which was five, and we don't have a one coming in, so that's all we have to do. We just square. So take whatever came out the first previous step, square it, and take that mod 35. Okay, that was easy. Let's just keep going. All right. Well, at the next step, it's a little different. We have to square, okay, to get a four here, but we don't want a 4, we want a 5. So we have to add an extra element of the base, okay? Because that gives us an extra term here, which is going to give us 4 plus 1, or 5. So we square what we got at the previous step, which was 25, and we throw in an extra term of 5. Multiply that out, take it mod 35. Okay? Now what? We want to get 10. We had an exponent of 5 previously. How do we get 10? Square. Okay, square whatever we had at the previous step. We had 10 at the previous step. Square it, take the result mod 35, you get 30. Finally, we want to get 20, so we take whatever came out of the previous step, we square it, take that mod 35, and we're done. And we got the same answer, which is good. Okay, now you're sitting out there and you're thinking, you got to be kidding me. Okay, this was easy. This is really complicated. Okay, why would you do the really complicated thing when you have this really easy thing up here? Well, for one thing, we can't do this. <laughs> this is not possible, okay, for the size of numbers we're dealing with. 
But for another fact, another fact is this is actually much more efficient. We're doing far less multiplications here than we did up here. And also, what about the size of the numbers? This number's too big, right? If we have really huge numbers to deal with. What about the numbers here? We never get a really large number. In fact, you can never get a number that's more than like the modulus cubed or something like that. Why is that? What's, what the, what's going on here? It's because we're doing the mod lots of times, okay? We're doing it in various steps. And that's one of the basic properties of modular arithmetic. You can do the mod whenever you want. So we're choosing to do it at each step here instead of waiting for the number to get really large before we apply that mod operation. So, okay, so no huge numbers and it's actually more efficient. Now, every implementation of RSA in the universe uses repeated squaring. You have to do this. There's no other way you can implement RSA. Now, lots of implementations of RSA use other tricks as well. If you want to know what those other tricks are, look at my uh, cryptanalysis book. There's several of them described in there. And they actually turn out to be important for certain types of attacks that people have come up with on RSA. You really have to look very hard at the specifics of the implementation. But this is the first step, okay? This is the basic thing that everybody has to do, and most of them do more than this as well. In other words, there are lots of tricks you can use to speed up the modular exponentiation, but this, that's the beginning, beginning for all of them. Uh, okay, so even with the repeated square, uh, RSA is going to be way, way slower than your favorite symmetric cipher. I mean, orders of magnitude slower. Okay, so anything we can do to speed up RSA is a plus. So here's another trick that people often use to speed up RSA. We can choose equal three. Okay, remember, when we're choosing the key, what do we do? We choose the P and Q. We get P minus one, Q minus one. Then we choose E relatively prime. Usually three works, okay? Usually. If it doesn't, throw away P and Q and start over, okay? So we can make it so that E is equal to three for everybody, okay? Everybody can use E equal three. Now, they won't have the same modulus. Okay? People better not have the same modulus. They better not have the same private key, which they won't because P and Q are different. But everybody can choose, everyone can have, you can set it up so everybody has E equal three. Okay, so what's the benefit of that? I suppose we're, you know, it's like a, in your company. You're setting up the public key system for your company. Everybody needs a public-private key pair. It's your job to generate the public-private key pair. You set it up so everybody gets E equal three. They all have different Ds and different Ns, but E equal three for everybody. Why might that be beneficial? Well, <laughs> I gotta turn off this camera so I can cur curse a little bit here. So. Anyway, so uh, why might that be beneficial? I think about it. Otherwise, you, if you just sort of randomly choose a number E, you could find one that works, but it's probably gonna have hundreds of bits, okay? Go back to the repeated squaring algorithm. If you have hundreds of bits in there, that's hundreds of steps that you need to go through. If E is equal to three, how many steps in the repeated squaring algorithm? Two. Two, and you're done. You've encrypted the message in two steps. Okay, so it can't get any better than that. That's the smallest number that will work. So think about it. You want to now send a message out to everybody in your company. Okay, the server has to encrypt this message to everybody as it goes out, right? So the server can do fast encryptions and send the message out to everybody. Now how about when you receive the message? What do you need to do to decrypt? You need to raise it to the D power. Is D equal to three? No, I mean, D is some, you know, hundreds of bits thing again. So that's a lot of work for you, but you only do it once. The server does it like lots of times, right? So we're sort of spreading the work for, you know, distributing the work for the decryption, which is good, because it's harder, but speeding up the work for the encryption, which we need to do because it's concentrated in one place. Now, on the other hand, if the server has to do a lot of signatures, this wouldn't help. <laughs> okay. But for encryption, it would be beneficial. Okay, so the encryption is only required two operations. Private key stuff is still expensive. There's kind of an interesting 
quirk here that arises. Now suppose we set this up equal three. Everybody's got equal three. Now I generate a message I want to encrypt. Your, exp your encryption exponent's equal three. This message is, is a number, right? I treat it like a number. Suppose as a number, this m is less than the cube root of n, your n, right? Your public key. What happens when I take when I encrypt this? It's m cubed. What can you tell me about m cubed? It's less than n. If a number is less than n, what happens when you take it mod n? Nothing. <laughs> Okay, so you take this m cubed, you take it, nothing happened, so I'm sending m cubed. Okay, you're the attacker. You see m cubed comes by. How do you get m? Punch it in your calculator and say cube root. You get m. Okay, so it's very easy to attack in that particular case. It's trivial to get the message back in that case. Uh, and that, we, we'll call that a cube root attack. How would we prevent that attack? Pad the message. We already have to pad the message. Why do we pad the message? Why did we say to do that before? To prevent the forward search attack, right? Okay, so we already have to pad the message. As long as we're padding the message, we can make it so the number always has a number. It's always large enough to prevent this. But you still should be aware that you know this is a possibility. Uh, there's another version of this, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it relies on a fancy result called the Chinese remainder theorem. And what happens is, regardless of what the message is, if I take the same message and send it to three different users who all have E equal three, but different N and different P, right? They all have E equal three. The attacker can take those three messages and sort of combine them together and break it, figure out what the message is. And it's not much more work than this cube root. It's a little bit more, but not much more. Now again, the padding would prevent this, okay, if you did it right, but it's a possible attack. And I just mention it because you see as 265 students may get a chance to actually play around with this. Okay, so again, padding the message with random bits prevents uh, both of these attacks. Now, so there's nothing really wrong, inherently wrong, with using E equal three as an encryption exponent, but there was, um, a few years ago, there was a signature scheme that relied on you know, some uh, trick like very similar to this uh, to speed things up. And it had a flaw, so people were able to break it. And uh, so people are kind of suspicious of using E equal three. So they recommend you don't use E equal three. <laughs> so the alternative, which is almost as good, is to use two to the 16 plus one. If you think about this, when you do the uh, encryption, Okay, how many steps in the square, uh, repeated squaring? It's like 17 steps, right? You have to square like 16 times and do one extra step. Yeah. It's like 16 or 17 steps. It's still very fast, okay, compared to doing hundreds of steps. So it's still a very, very uh, big savings. Now, there is a potential attack here, though, right? If you were to take and encrypt the same message and send it to two to the 16 plus one different people, an attacker could put those together, use the Chinese remainder theorem, and cover, recover the plain text. But if you're sending the same message to the 16 plus one different people, it's not going to be secret anyway. So you know, 